You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health Podcast. I have John Cumbers, who's the founder of SynBioBeta. The website is S-Y-N-B-I-O-B-E-T-A.com. So, John, thanks for coming. Thanks for having me on, Rich. Yeah, tell me, what's the premise of uh, SynBioBeta? We are an innovation network for the synthetic biology industry, and the synthetic biology industry is an industry that's trying to make biology easier to engineer. So, Okay, when you say engineer, like in what way, what are you trying to make easier? So if you think about the last 30 years of biotechnology, we've been using recombinant DNA to read, write, and edit the genomes of cells so that they can produce everything from drugs to materials to flavors, fragrances, chemicals. Everything that we use in modern biotechnology is the product of genetic engineering. And we want to make it easier to engineer meaning we want to turn it into a robust, reliable, predictable engineering discipline like we have for other engineering disciplines like computer engineering or software engineering or civic engineering or structure engineering. Do you think biology being as complex as it is will lend itself to being able to be characterized like this? I mean, like when I consider, for instance, you know, a ribosome in the human body can make, well, like 20,000 different proteins. It just seems like, I don't know, crazily complex. It's definitely crazily complex, and it's definitely a long-term vision to make it rational, to design it, and easy to engineer, but it's not unsurmountable. Well, that's good. So what are some of the things that you think will be the first amenable um, things that can be created using using cells and using biology? If you look at some of the products that are out in the marketplace already, One that was just launched a couple of weeks ago was by a company called Perfect Day, and they are making ice cream using whey protein that instead of making it from milking cows and extracting it from cow milk, they took the sequence for the whey protein and they put it into a yeast cell and they brew whey protein instead of brewing alcohol like you might normally use yeast for. Okay, that makes sense. What are some other things that um, we're going to use bacterial, I don't know if you call them vectors, but uh, bacteria to, to make what other substances are on the list? Sure. Another release that came just this week was by a Japanese company called Spiber. And Spiber is doing the same process and they're actually brewing materials. So they are taking products from nature, such as the genetic sequence for spider silk, and they're doing the same with that there engineering it to enhance the properties, to make it stronger, more durable, more stretchy, all these different properties of spider silk. And they are now brewing that. So sugar into a fermenter, spider silk protein out the other side. And they launched a jacket with the North Face brand just recently called the Moon Parker, a Parker jacket. And that was just announced just this week from the Japanese fashion show that they did. What uh, characteristics does it have that set it apart from other jackets, for instance? I'd have to go back and look at the press release that they put out. But certainly the uh, the concept of this is that you can make fabric that is softer. You can make fabric that is stretchier. Just because nature has produced these natural fabrics like cotton and silk doesn't mean that we can't look at the molecular properties of those natural proteins that exist. And we can't engineer performance performance parameters into those novel proteins. Yeah, it makes sense. Isn't, um, isn't insulin created from bacteria as well? Insulin 
is mostly created from yeast these days. But when Genentech was founded and they took that insulin sequence from humans and put it into a cell, they started with E. coli. So they're two different forms of chassis organisms is what we call them in the industry because they're like a car chassis. You can put different stuff in it and drive it somewhere. Uh, you can use E. coli, which are bacteria. You could use yeast, which are um, which are eukaryotic cells. But they're both the same principle put them in a bioreactor, bi put sugar in, heat them up and stir them, and you get the product that you want out the other end. Okay. So, so what are what are bacteria and yeast vectors or uh, chassis good for? What do they have trouble with? That's a great question. They're good at we, – we call E. coli the workhorse of molecular biology. So it's a very versatile organism that can be used for many different things. It's used for – editing um sorry it's used for cloning and uh don't be put off by the word cloning uh, cloning just means the replication of dna but but e coli is very good for that it's very good for drug production there's actually a company called synlogic out of cambridge massachusetts and synlogic is producing e coli that are not harmful to the human body they're a they're a, a common strain of e coli that's non toxic and they've actually got it producing a drug. And so you actually consume E. coli and it goes into your gut and it releases a drug and then it passes through your system. So pretty incredible living medicine. So what do, um, again, bacteria and yeast have trouble with? Oh, yeah. Sorry, the last part of your question. Um, well, that's one of the things that, that bacteria have trouble with. That they're not all compatible with the human body. Some of them are, are nasty um, and uh, have things that uh, that don't interact well with the human body. Um, the other thing that they're not very good at is living under certain conditions. So certain pH or certain salinity or certain temperature, you really, instead of having a workhorse like E. coli, a one size fits all, you might want to go out and look in nature for a better chassis organism. Let's say, for example, if you wanted to produce a very stretchy form of silk, and that meant that you needed to grow the cells or run the fermenter at a low temperature because you didn't want to shock the protein and give it, a, uh, it maybe it becomes rigid at high temperature. I'm just making up an example here. Well, you might want to go out and look for organisms that live in, in warmer water uh, in, instead of hotter water. And you might want to find ones that produce natural fibers that are similar to silk and maybe they grow in a high sunlight and low pH environment. And you might want to test those in your lab. So all these sorts of parameters you can find. And E. coli is pretty good and pretty versatile, but if you want to go after something more specialized, then you might want to look for a more speci specialized chassis organism. How do you get the, uh, like, why does the chassis organism matter at the end stage once you get it to make, you know, a certain thing? What, how do you get the, uh, let's say it makes whey. What do you do is you, you blender, the, uh, you chop up the bacteria and then just take the whey out of them and throw the bacteria material away or recycle it? Or how, how do you get stuff out of the bacteria once it's made it? That's a very good question as well. And I'm not an expert in this. It's I'm, I, I understand more about what goes on at the genetics level of these organisms and how to get the organism to make something. I know less about the what's called downstream processing and separation. But I did recently visit a operation that does the downstream processing in Ljubljana in Slovenia, where I was visiting a company there called ACS Bio. That's A-C-I-E-S. And they have a really cool pilot plant facility that was funded by the European Union for doing fermentation and scale up. And you go in there and it looks just like a brewery if you think about a brewery, they have some separation that needs to go on at the end of it. They probably have to, um, they have to take away some of the uh, some of the cells uh, out of the out of the processing plant. Um, but they did tell me one product that they made, and I I can't remember exactly what the product was, but I think it was a f an enzyme used in food processing, and that's fairly common for synthetic biology companies and biotech companies to be making enzymes because enzymes have particular functions such as 
an amylase or a lipase. Lipase breaks down lipids. Um, so, uh, so let's say that you're breaking, wanting to break down lipids in food processing. And that could be because maybe you're making chocolate and you want to break down fats and, uh, uh, that are naturally present in the cocoa bean, for example. Again, I'm just making up an example here. I'm not an expert on cocoa bean processing, but you want to now produce that lipase. So you've t- found the lipase gene in an environment in nature. You've sequenced it. So you know what the A's, C's, T's and G's are. Now you want to ferment that lipase protein. So you take the sequence that you've got, you synthesize it using DNA synthesis, using one of the many DNA synthesis companies out there, and you splice it into the genome of a a bacteria like E. coli or of a yeast cell. Now you've got it in that cell, you put that cell in a bioreactor, you add sugar, water, you heat it up, you stir it, and the production of that lipase then is made in the cell. Now there's two ways that you can get it out of the cell because you now want to 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 take it and uh, clean it up and purify it so that you can use it in your chocolate making. The first way to get it out of the cell is to engineer a transport mechanism in uh, to take it from inside the cell to outside the cell. So proteins are always made inside the cell. Some of them are exported to get outside of the cell. So if you can engineer in an export mechanism, and that normally involves a pore, a protein pore, or some active transport mechanism that you stick in the membrane of the cell. And you could say, I'll only allow, allow cells of certain shape or certain size to go through that pore. So let's imagine that you did that for the lipase and you engineered it so that it exports lipase. Now, when you are at the end of your fermentation, when the cell has used up all the sugar and it's turned it all into lipase, you now want some separation mechanism where you want to separate the cells from the supernatant or the soup uh, that's, that's, uh, that you've used for fermentation. And you could do right. that via, via spinning. You could do that via uh, size separation. There's a couple of different ways that you could, that you could do that. The second uh, option is that you can't get the lipase out of the cell. It's actually in the cell. And then you've just got to smash the cell open using some mechanical force and uh, and break open the lipase. And then once you've done that, again, you want to separate and there's various ways that you can separate it. Now you've separated it, but it's still in the liquid. Um, what I saw at this uh, factory or this uh, scale up plant in Slovenia, which was really cool, was a giant drum where they spray all of that uh, fermentation liquid all around the barrel of the drum and they heat it up and then what that does then is is create a white powder you can then scrape it all off put it in a barrel and then you can do your quality assurance on it and put it in a in a jar and then it's uh, it's ready to sell to the people who make cocoa how do you you said you know quite a bit about how bacteria actually will use the substance to make another substance <clears throat> What are you doing? Are you just giving the bacteria a particular food and they're taking that in and their own biochemistry is putting out the parts you want? Or do you have to knock out a gene or change their genetic makeup so that when you present them with a certain starter that they make what you want them to make? There's various ways to skin the cat. The uh, the, the way that you suggested is a good way. And uh, I'll give you one example of a product that's made in that way. You're probably familiar with amino acids and know that you need to eat them in your in your diet. And of course, the reason that you need to eat those 20 amino acids is because those 20 amino acids are the alphabet that the body uses or the cell uses to make other proteins. So if I eat a piece of chicken for lunch today, it goes into my stomach, the acids break down the proteins in that chicken into the individual amino acids. And then Uh, I digest those and then my body reuses those amino acids. Now, if I starve myself of protein, my body can still make amino acids. And that is because I have inside of me and bacteria have inside of them some pathways for making our own amino acids. And a pathway in molecular biology is a series of enzymes that, that make and break chemical bonds. So they take a, a, a substrate, which is something that you start with, and it passes it from one enzyme to the other, making and breaking chemical bonds, adding new elements to it, adding a hydrogen group, adding an oxygen group, adding an iron uh, to it, and and it builds up this chemical. So it's this manufacturing process for making different molecules. And so 
the example I was going to give to you is, for example, a lysine synthesis pathway. Lysine is one of those 20 amino acids. And there's a big market globally for lysine. You, If you're a bodybuilder, you can probably go into GNC supplement store and buy a bottle of lysine. Um, again, I'm, I'm not a bodybuilder, but I'm giving you an example. You can definitely go in and buy <laughs> other amino acids. You can definitely go in and buy other amino acids and different protein shakes and things. But I know lysine is is used. I think it's used in cattle feed. I think it's one of the bodybuilding uh, amino acids. So there's a market just for that particular amino acid, and that's made via fermentation, and that's made via um, via biotechnology. One of the ways that you can make lysine is by taking E. coli, which I'm sure produces lysine automatically uh, because it needs it. And then you can actually look at the metabolism that's going on in the whole E. coli cell. And the E. coli cell is taking in sugar, swimming around in the media, and it's producing all sorts of different things. Now, one of the things that it's probably producing, or I know it's producing, would be a protein for its flagella motor. And the flagella motor is the thing that spins around at the end of the E. coli cell and allows it to move. Now, let's say, for example that you don't want the E. coli cell to move about because you're happy, you're putting it in a reactor, you're turning that reactor, and it's just going to produce lysine for you. Well, you could knock out the genes that make the flagella motor in the E. coli cell. So now that E. coli cell, you've knocked them out, it just sits there, and it doesn't have to make those proteins in its tail, and it doesn't move anywhere because you're creating all of that movement with a propeller in the tank. At the same time, you could take the pathway that produces lysine and you could soup it up. And there's ways to soup it up. One of them would be to do what's called promoter hacking. And a promoter is the piece of DNA before the lysine gene synthesis. And you could take out a weak promoter and put in a strong promoter. And the promoter is where the, um, the all the mechanism for, for protein synthesis uh, binds to sorry for, for for RNA synthesis binds to and uh, it's RNA polymerase if people are familiar with with or remember their molecular biology it's RNA RNA polymerase that binds to that promoter before the gene you put in a stronger promoter more RNA polymerase will bind you'll get more lysine synthesis RNA and you'll get more lysine protein or amino acid uh, produced. So that's one way that you could yeah. hack into the E. coli genome and say, I'm going to turn off your tail spinning because I don't want you to make that protein. I don't need it. And I'm going to crank up your lysine production. And both of those things combined will supercharge the lysine synthesis. And you'll have a lot of lysine now produced from that particular engineered strain. So I guess scientists need to look at existing bacteria and yeast and their biochemical pathways and identify is the thing we want to make at least an intermediary or an end product that this this creature normally makes, and then you can modulate the amount it creates, et cetera. But does it have to be there in their biochemical pathways, or can you introduce somehow a new mechanism into an existing organism, or is that just too difficult? That You can absolutely do that. If you look at Genentech and, and the, the insulin gene, in, uh, bacteria do not produce insulin. E. coli doesn't produce insulin. Humans and mammals produce insulin. So they sequence the insulin gene from humans. They put it into bacteria and uh, away they went. So are, are companies or are scientists creating a library of known biochemical pathways that exist in bacteria and yeast so people can look it up as a reference and say, oh, look, this this bacteria makes the uh, you know whey protein molecule as part of its uh, normal metabolism. Let's use that as a chassis. Absolutely, they are. And um, unfortunately, we still don't know what about 40% of the genes do in E. coli, which is kind of funny um, given how much it's been studied and sequenced and synthesized. But it's not funny because biology, as you said right at the top of the podcast, is very, very complicated. And we're only just scratching the surface of what we can do. And that kind of goes back to this vision of synthetic biology, making biology easier to engineer. I mean, can you believe that we don't know what 40% of the genes in E. coli, e. coli do, given how much yeah. we can do with E. coli and what we can do with biotechnology? We're still pretty useless at it. And that's why there's a lot of money being spent uh, both at the research level, at university, and at the industry level and funding a lot of these companies. And if you look at who's actually making the money in the industry right now, 
it's the tool makers. They are, look at the stock price of Thermo Fisher Scientific, look at the stock price of Illumina, look at the stock price of Twist Bioscience, and they're all billion dollar companies, multi billion dollar companies in some cases. And they're all making tools that serve into these industries. And so we've got so, we're, we're just at the beginning of this, uh, what I'm calling the, uh, the bio enlightenment, the next century of biology, where we really start to not only understand what's going on inside of a cell, but also to be able to rationally design and engineer products and, and cells that are made with biology. So what, what, what are Symbio Beta specifically? Are there, what projects are you working on? So I don't do any real work. Rich, all I do is connect other people together in the industry, and uh, oh, it's a it's a it's a full time it's a full time role. And I help to connect academics who have technology that they want to license. I help to connect founders together so that they can start new companies, and I help to connect investors to those companies so that they can meet them and invest in them. And then, as those company grow, companies grow, we listen to their needs and we provide other goods and services. For example, we do business development dinners to talk to the Fortune 500. We do uh, annual conferences coming up in three weeks time in San Francisco. And we have about 40 different partnering uh, rooms where people can do one-on-one meetings. And we also, I also have a venture fund myself and uh, I back seed stage companies and we take as our limited partners, larger Fortune 500 companies who want to invest in the industry. So that's kind of what we do. We're a media company. We're an advocacy group for the whole industry. We do some training courses. And uh, I also have a column in Forbes magazine that I write about biomanufacturing for industries that aren't yet involved in biology. Oh, wow. So um, are scientists and companies on the right track? Are they getting it right? Or you know, like what are the trends that you're seeing lately that are going to be impactful upon you know what what's going to be made and where this is going to be going in the next few years. Sure, I wrote something for Forbes called the Bio Belt: Reinvigorating Rural America with Biotechnology. And there's definitely a trend that we're seeing with the Bio Belt uh, in Washington D.C. in in the Central Valley in California for taking the the very rich, very uh, affluent areas of the bioeconomy, the Bay Area, Boston, San Diego, Seattle, New York, LA, and seeing those technologies and that economic prosperity spread to the parts of this California, where they're not the Central Valley, states like Indiana, Iowa, North Dakota, country, uh, states that have biomass, they have uh, facilities and they need entrepreneurs, they need capital, and they need scale-up pilot facilities that are going to help those startups grow and scale to become larger companies. So I'm seeing that, the bio belt, and the the need to spread the good things that biotechnology is doing more broadly, I think would be a great way to, uh, a great way to start, and that's an interesting trend that I'm seeing. Huh. It's funny, the bio belt, so I guess you're a bio thumper, you could say, right? Yeah. Oh my goodness. I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. I'm a bio thumper. Yeah. So we actually started a bio belt ambassadors program and um, we have about 35 bio belt ambassadors all across the country. And I think I should start to call them the bio thumpers. That would be wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Any, um, I mean, since you're looking at the industry kind of uh, as a, a top down overall view, I don't know, any strange or peculiar or amazing things that you're seeing? stuff that just surprises you in a good or bad way? Well, I'm at the edge of the envelope in terms of uh, crazy and innovative and cool. Um, There's definitely the the, the stuff that's maybe uh, a little bit crazy is the the biohacking and gene editing. I don't know if you've been following the work of Josiah Zaina at the Odin, but he's, uh, he's injected himself with CRISPR. He's running courses for... Uh, gene editing at home. He has been Wait. sent a cease and desist letter by, um, I think by, uh, I can't remember. You'd have to look up on his blog. I think it was uh, asking him, he, he's being investigated by the FDA for, for practicing medicine at home, which he denies. Um, at home? And at home, on yeah. Uh, on himself and, 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 and encouraging other people to uh, do it, or at least teaching other people to do it. Um, 
Yeah, oh. Josiah Zayna, Z A Y N E R, and the Odin, O D I N. Uh, I, uh, I encourage you to, to to look him up. He's a, he's a friend of mine. He's a colleague of mine. Um, uh, but he definitely attracted the attention of the state legislature in California as they've put through legislation just recently to ban uh, in home. Uh, or, or not to ban it, but to put a warning label to say on gene editing kits to say not for use uh, at home. Um, mm. So that, that's a that's an interesting uh, use of the technology. From Z- Josiah's point of view, he is democratizing access to these critical technologies, particularly for healthcare for people who want cancer treatment uh, but can't afford it. Um, that's uh, his argument for why these technologies should be broadly available and people should be allowed to experiment on themselves. And I agree with that. I think that they should. I think we shouldn't over-regulate it. Um, and, but uh, the way that Josiah does things is, is, is uh, quite fun and out there. And, uh, and I think that's why he gets, he gets a lot of uh, publicity and a lot of attention for the things he does. Uh, I think his heart is in the right place uh, for wanting to do what he does. So, I think that's one example of some of the crazy stuff that's going on. Um, One of the coolest things that's going on is a company called Z-Biotics, which recently launched their product. And uh, their product is a hangover cure, a probiotic hangover cure. So this is a version, a different bacterium. It's called Bacillus subtilis. It's not E. coli. And it's a naturally occurring gut bacteria. It's a healthy, good bacterium. And uh, Mm the... This bacteria is used in many different ways um, for industrial biotechnology, but the way that they're using it is they're taking a gene, and this gene is called acid aldehyde dehydrogenase. And so it's an aldehyde dehydrogenase, meaning it breaks down aldehyde. And aldehyde is actually a carcinogen. So aldehyde is known to give you cancer. Or get, make, make mutations in in, uh, in DNA that, that end in cancer. And aldehyde is a byproduct of alcohol metabolism. So if I drank a beer now, uh, it would be degraded by the enzymes in my body into, um, uh, I'm actually not sure what the end products of alcohol degradation are, but it would, you know, go through my, uh, go through my urine and, and, and pass through and the, uh, the alcohol would go into my blood and, and, uh, and pass through eventually or be, be metabolized uh, eventually as a, as a sugar source. Um, I, again, I'm, 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 I think that's the way, uh, the, the way alcohol breakdown work, uh, works. I need to, uh, I need to become better educated. Uh, I'm actually, after I tried this product and it worked, which is, it did, it's amazingly good hangover cure. I actually joined the company as an advisor. So full disclosure, they are my, uh, they, they, they are an, I'm an advisor to the company. Um, and uh, aldehyde uh, is the byproduct of alcohol breakdown. And it's the thing that gets into your bloodstream and it causes inflammation in the, um, in, in the, uh, in the blood vessels in your brain. And inflammation is, 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 is a bad thing. And it causes that horrible throbbing uh, from the signs of a, of a bad hangover the next day. So this is a probiotic uh, organism that you, that you take, sort of spores, activates in your gut, produces aldehyde dehydrogenase and breaks down uh, aldehyde and stops you from getting a hangover. And it works amazingly well. And what company is this? This is called Z-Biotics. Z-B-I-O-T-I-O-T-I-C, sorry, S. Biotic, Z-Biotics. Wow. Huh. And they're in, the cool. Bay, um, yeah, they're in the Bay Area. Yeah. You, could, uh, you could get some. They're also, uh, it's also available by, uh, by mail order on their website. Any... Uh... I mean, any other uh, interesting companies that you looked at that you think are doing really great stuff? They don't have to be necessarily crazy, but, you know, that are doing uh, really avant-garde things. Um, there's a couple of companies that are doing DNA barcoding for tracking physical products using sequencing. So bacteria are everywhere around us. You've probably heard there's as many bacterial cells in your body as there are human cells. And that bacteria is um, has a unique signature on it. And that unique signature is made up by the different colony of bacteria. So if, if on my hand, if we sequence it, you'd find maybe, I don't know, 500, maybe 10,000, somewhere in that range of different bacterial cells on my hand. And 
if on your hand you would find a similar amount but a completely different subset depending what's growing uh, on, my, on my hands. So this company is doing environmental sequencing of those organisms um, or these companies. One of them is called Carver and uh, Ellen Jorgensen is the, is the CEO of Carver and the other one is called Phylogen and uh, Jessica Livingstone is the CEO of Phylogen. And what this is allowing you to do is to take a sample, let's say like a uh, an apple, and I could sequence that apple when I when I pluck it from the tree in Washington State, and I could sequence Ooh. that apple again when I buy it at the Whole Foods in San Francisco, and I would be able to demonstrate to you that that apple from Whole Foods in San Francisco was from that tree in in Washington and and trace back when it was picked and where it went Ooh. along the way. So it's a very interesting uh, application area for food tracking and food safety and provenance of where things have come from. And I think that's a really cool application of, uh, of biology. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Huh. Well, excellent. Well, um, John, how could this be useful to you for listeners that want to get in touch? What kinds of things would you be interested to hear about, you know, opportunities for, you know, for new companies that are doing various biohacking, bioengineering? I mean, what's the best way for people to get in touch and what would you like to hear about from listening? Sure. The best way to get in touch is to sign up for my weekly newsletter. You can sign up at synbiobeta.com, S-Y-N-B-I-O-B-E-T-A.com. And follow us on Twitter. We have about 20,000 people who uh, are following us on Twitter and interested in the stories that we put out about the industry. The best place to meet these companies is it, is in San Francisco, October 1 through 3. We're always the uh, first week of October. And we have about 1,000, 1,200 people coming together. And it's mostly the CEOs, the founders, the investors in the industry. And it's a fantastic event, very fun. This year, some of the highlights include Eric Schmidt and George Church. So Eric Schmidt, the chairman of Google, or he's he's now uh, uh, moved on from, from that position, but he's still involved in Alphabet. And uh, George Church, who is a MIT Harvard professor, they're going to be talking about synthetic biology and AI. We have a whole session with Moira Gunn from Tech Nation on engineering antibodies and the immune system. We have a really cool session on space technologies and synthetic biology. Frances Arnold is the Nobel laureate from Caltech. She's going to be speaking about uh, protein engineering. And Daphne Kohler from in situ bio is going to be talking about drug discovery and synthetic biology. And we have the space shuttle commander, Tim Copra, Jitendra Joshi from NASA, and and uh, hopefully uh, somebody very special from Blue Origin is going to be speaking, not Jeff Bezos, but uh, somebody equally uh, awesome. And uh, Esther Dyson is going to be moderating that session on space tech. And we have uh, Jason Kelly, who's the CEO of Ginkgo Bioworks, speaking with Lisa Porter from the Department of Defense about defense applications and readiness levels for uh, for synthetic biology in the military, not for producing bioweapons, but for producing materials and chemicals and food products in the military and being able to think about the military being ready for in-situ biomanufacturing wherever they go. So some really cool stuff happening at the conference this year. And uh, we've been running this conference for eight years. It has a wonderful following, a really smart group of passionate, driven people there. And the name of the conference again and where is it going to be? It's SynBioBeta. And it is October 1 through 3, and it's at SVN West, the old Fillmore Music Hall in San Francisco. Okay, excellent. Well, John, this has been a great call. So many things I could have asked you, and you got a lot good out, uh, but you got a lot more stored within you that, uh, than I could have imagined. Thank you for being here on the podcast. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Rich. Really good to talk with you. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. 
If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you.